The Bible is the divinely inspired, infallible word of the living God. The Bible does not contain the word of God. The, The Bible is the word of God. Within the Bible is everything we need to know for what we are to believe and how we are to behave. And the Bible is the final authority for every Christian in all matters of faith and practice. Hallelujah. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Please take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 11. And this morning, we will focus our attention on verses 10 through 15. The the message, the title of the message last week, do you recall? A hopeful beginning. Numerous people were paying attention. That's good. For most people, when they sit down to watch a movie, what do they do? They may get some popcorn, perhaps a few other snacks and a drink. They get comfortable in their seat, maybe with a blanket, at least in our home, and they are fully prepared to be immersed in the experience of watching that movie. They are waiting in anticipation for that story to begin. It's exciting. This morning, are you fully prepared to be immersed in learning from God's word? Do you have your Bibles with you? Is your mind set on his word? Are you focused on actively engaging mentally with me as we dig into this amazing story? Last week, we learned about Nahash, the Ammonite king who besieged Jabesh Gilead. Instead of turning to God, we learned that the people attempted to make a covenant with the Ammonites to potentially avoid any slaughter or slavery. And we know from the text of Scripture that God had, in, had instructed his people to never make a covenant with foreigners. One of the core reasons for this was to avoid becoming like them. This would lead to their eventual destruction. It's a basic principle. But the people that you hang around, you become like. You start to act like them. You start to talk like them. You end up setting their idols as your very own. We see this time and time again in the recorded word of God. And we see this today with our own relationships. When we invest time with those who are not righteous, we become like them. It's a basic principle and it's proven true most of the time. Except for when you are a man or a woman of God and you are resolute, you have a foundation of the word of God and you are able to stand when the fiery darts come against you and you can influence people towards God. If we reject this basic instruction, we are foolish. Unfortunately, the more that we reject the guidance of God, our our fleshly desires become like an addictive drug. And they pull us in further. We become closed or calloused to the truth. And it fails to have a positive effect on us. Then comes some level of destruction. We need to set our minds on the things above and reject the lusts of our flesh. Colossians 3.2 instructs us, So set your minds on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. We also learned that Nahash gave Jabesh Gilead the opportunity to send messengers to the tribes of Israel to see if any would come to their aid. (laughs) Why? Not exactly sure, but he gave them the flexibility to seek help. I noted last week that it may have been because Nahash was knowledgeable about the former destruction of Jabesh from the Israelites. Remember, most of the men of Jabesh were killed. They were weak. So they were easy pickings. Who would come to their aid anyway, he thought. But regardless, Saul, king of the Israelites, heard about the situation with Nahash, and the Spirit of God came upon him mightily, and he became very angry. His response to the messengers who were sent for help was highly encouraging to them. Look at 1 Samuel 11, 9. They said to the messengers who had come, Thus you shall say to the men of Jabesh Gilead, Tomorrow, by the time the sun is hot, you will have deliverance. So the messengers went and told the men of Jabesh, and they were glad. So they were fairly close to the war, to the battlefield. 
Knowing the previous issue that Jabesh had, their almost complete destruction because they refused to engage and support in battle with the 11 tribes of Israel against the tribe of Benjamin for the wickedness of men from that tribe. Yet Saul, Samuel, Israel, and Judah amassed 330,000 men to come and fight on their behalf against Nahash and the Ammonites. The past was the past, and the focus was on unity within Israel for a new beginning. Even with dissenters within the midst of Israel, the goal and objective was to unify the nation, and this becomes even more clear shortly. Unity of God's people is extremely important for the health and vitality of the body of Christ. Do you want a strong church that is able to stand against the wicked culture? Unity. That's how you achieve that. Galatians 6, 2, bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. Psalm 133, verse 1, behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. Ephesians 4, 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to to the fullness of Christ. Romans 12, 4 through 5, for just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. So this brings us to our passage of scripture that we'll be focusing on this morning. First Samuel 11, 10 through 15. You should have your Bibles in front of you. So please follow along with me as I read the text. The title for the ministry this morning is Deception destruction, and victory. Then the men of Jabesh said, Tomorrow we will come out to you, and you may do to us whatever seems good to you. The next morning Saul put the people in three companies, and they came into the midst of the camp at the morning watch and struck down the Ammonites until the heat of the day. Those who survived were scattered, so that no two of them were left together. Then the people said to Samuel, Who is he that said, Saul shall reign over us? Bring the men that we may put them to death. But Saul said, Not a man shall be put to death this day, for today the Lord has accomplished deliverance in Israel. Then Samuel said to the people, Come and let us go to Gilgal and renew the kingdom there. So all the people went to Gilgal. And there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. There they also offered sacrifices of peace offerings before the Lord. And there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. What's going on in verse 10? Then the men of Jabesh said, Tomorrow we will come out to you, and you may do to us whatever seems good to you. The messengers who had come to Saul had returned home to Jabesh. You'll recall back in verse 3 that they previously told Nahash that if they weren't successful in getting some assistance in battle, they would come out to him to do whatever he wanted with them. This must have been what Nahash was hoping for. Verse 3, the elders of Jabesh said to him, Let us alone for seven days that we may send messengers throughout the territory of Israel. Then if there is no one to deliver us, we will come out to you. The result of no help to Jabesh would be multifold. First, firstly, they would be made slaves to the Ammonites. Secondly, they would have their right eyes gouged out So they would be useless in battle, suitable only to be slaves. You remember, hold your hold your 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 uh, your shield in your left hand, and what would you do if your right eye was gouged out and you had your sword? You'd be useless in battle. Thirdly, they would be a reproach to Israel. Not only was Jabesh Gilead considered a former enemy of Israel, even though. They were actually part of Israel, but now they would be considered disapproved and rebuked before Israel. They would bring significant shame to Israel. 
Again, that was the hope of King Nahash based on his comments to them. However, didn't they just meet with their new king? Saul, the same day or the day before who committed to come and fight for them? The very next day? Was this some sort of ploy the men of Jabesh had? Did they share some kind of disinformation, perhaps, to Nahash? Disinformation has a specific purpose in mind. It's false information deliberately uh, spread to deceive people. Disinformation is the strategic dissemination or passing out of false information with the intent of causing public harm. Isn't this the sort of thing that's happening today? Do we have a serious issue in this nation with disinformation? What about within churches across this nation? If pastors are not teaching the counsel of the word of God, then they are spreading their own stories and ideas. It will only cause harm. It will not build up the people of God. It will lay a weak foundation of faith for the church. When the strong storms of life come, that foundation is sure to crumble. Do you recall from last week what the name Nahash means? That's right, it it means serpent. Now the first serpent, Satan, sought to deceive Adam and Eve. He spread disinformation. He spread lies because he sought to bring death and destruction to the image of God, mankind, and to his entire creation. Cyril, Cyril Barber shares his thoughts on this particular matter. Nahash, of course, understood the message to mean that their appeal for help had failed. He believed that the people would surrender themselves to him in verse 10. And being overconfident, he may have recalled his scouts. For no one raised an alarm as Saul and his men made their way down to the Jordan, crossed the river, and converged upon the unsuspecting Ammonite camp while it was still dark. The men of Nahash did have a ploy. They had a strategy to make it seem as if help was not on the way. They wanted Nahash and his army to relax so that the element of surprise would be on their side. They would give Saul and his army a distinct advantage over their enemy. This is the same sort of guidance we are charged with in our Christian faith because of our enemy, the enemy of souls. 1 Peter 5.8, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring delight. Lion seeking someone to devour. Our guidance and our objective is to remain vigilant, to be on the alert, is to, ha- is to have our eyes wide open. How can we be alert? What can we do to in- ensure that we are prepared to deal with the fiery darts of our enemy? We should be in constant communion with him, praying throughout the day. We can, be in, we, can, we can be consistent in reading, our, reading his holy word each and every day so that the Spirit of God will bring to our minds his truth, which brings comfort and confidence in our Savior when we encounter challenge and opposition. When we know the word, when we encounter opposition and challenge, he will bring it to our mind. So, Jabesh had a ploy. They had a strategy that was focused on the element of surprise. Remember, we're talking about 330,000 men who came to fight, divided into three companies. This is a significant presence of fighting men. The three companies would either come in waves, one after another, or they would come from different directions to cause further dismay. It was very important that they would have the element of surprise. 1 Samuel 11, verse 11. The next morning, Saul put the people in three companies, and they came into the midst of the camp at the morning watch and struck down the Ammonites until the heat of day. Those who survived were scattered so that no two of them were left together. The results were prophetic. Saul told them in verse 9, Tomorrow, by the time the sun is hot, 
you will have deliverance. This is exactly what happened. They struck down the Ammonites until the, quote, heat of the day, as the text says. It's not surprising, though. You see, considering the Spirit of God came upon, came upon Saul mightily, it was the Spirit of God who gave Saul the inspiration to state the words of deliverance. This is, this is not something that Saul had come up with on, on his own. The same thing is true for you and me. We can do nothing apart from Christ. We are in Christ, and that is the reason that we can do anything that has any sort of merit at all. John 15, 5 states, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. That's humbling, but it's true. You need to know it. Then the following statement is absolutely true, taking that verse in consideration. If you are not in Christ, you are worthless. You are incapable of generating any sort of success in life. The irony here is that type of person is not, is not actually in life. They are in death. So the question has to be asked, are you struggling with seeing godly success in your life? I'm not talking about making lots of money, having a large home, an asset, securing an executive job, having a significant influence in the community to influence law and policy. I'm talking about influencing others towards the kingdom. I'm talking about seeing the Lord bring people to himself because your life is such a witness of the truth that you're a magnet to others to want to know what it is about you that is so different from the rest of the world. One of my brothers, uh, well, I'll use that term lightly, this week is going through serious challenges in his life. He is not a Christian. That's why I'm careful with the term brothers there. But he called me to express his sincere appreciation for the prayers that we were offering up to him on his behalf and his mother who's now got cancer. And he told me, he said, I love you because of my focus towards him. He's not saved, but he needs to know the Lord or his destiny is destruction. The defeat of the Ammonites was so astounding that no two of the Ammonite fighters were left together. They were completely decimated and scattered. There ceased to be a fighting force for King Nahash. Clear victory was given by the Lord God and him alone. In one sense, Saul and the Israelites stepped on the head of the serpent, King Nahash. That's what his name means. This is what God does to all of his enemies. This is also what the Lord God said of Jesus in the book of Genesis, that he would crush the head of the serpent. Genesis 3, 14 through 15. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than any other beast of the field on your belly will you go and dust you will eat all the days of your life and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed he shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel the enmity is true hatred between Satan and the woman Eve and her seed it's also between the children of Satan worthless men and women, and the Lord Jesus Christ and his children. We are the children of God. So what was the bruise on the heel that Christ suffered? Now, that's a great question. Have you ever thought about that? It's an interesting statement. Well, we get our answer in the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, verse 5. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging, we are healed. A bruise to the heel would be painful. However, 
A crush by the heel to the head is fatal. This is why we always seek to crush the head of the snake in our garden to bring it to certain death. This is what Christ has done to Satan at the cross of Calvary. Because of what, the Lord, what our Lord and Savior has done for us to our sin, we need to reject sin and, and run from it, to render it powerless against us. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. James chapter 4, verse 7. We named James James because it's a biblical name. There's so much truth within the book of James. 1 Samuel eleven twelve 12 through 13. Then the, pap- then the people said to Samuel, Who is he that said, Shall Saul reign over us? They knew who was Saul. He was a coward, remember? He was good looking. He was tall. He looked kindly, but <laughs> it was Saul. Bring the men that we may put them to death. Remember back in chapter 10 and verse 27, but certain worthless men said, how can this one deliver us? And they despised him and did not bring him any present, but he kept silent. These are the exact men that the people were asking about to put to death. It's rather evident that they are worthless men who weren't too careful in providing their feedback about Saul. Their comments extended out past Saul and others. They were, def- they were definitely bold and mouthy. However, you recall, based upon what I've shared, that Saul didn't in- initially respond to those comments from these men. He let them say their thoughts. He kept silent. This time things are a little bit different. We have the response from Saul, even though they asked the question of Samuel. Samuel was clearly with Saul at this point, consider, considering that Samuel didn't reply to their question, but Saul answered instead. There's an important point to make here based upon Saul answering and, and not Samuel. Saul is asserting himself as the leader of Israel, replacing the role that Samuel had previously held for decades. Saul is acting differently than he previously did by hiding by the luggage. This is because the Spirit of God came upon him mightily. The answer Saul gave regarding these worthless men had a few different dynamics to it. Number one, 1 Samuel 11, 13. But Saul said, not a man shall be put to death this day, for today the Lord has accomplished deliverance in Israel. Number one, he recognizes who it was that brought them victory. It wasn't based upon their own merits. It wasn't based upon their own efforts. It was the Lord who brought Israel the victory. This is a key principle that we need to know. We need to understand clearly. We, when good things happen, need to give God the glory for anything that we do that has any value. Success never comes from from our efforts, but it comes from the Lord God who is omnipotent and who lives and reigns forever. We have Romans 11, 36. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Number two, Saul demonstrates mercy and forgiveness. He's gracious. Fiery darts are going to come our way from all sorts of different sources, even from Christians at times. But we need to model an attitude of gratitude and be gracious. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, And everything give thanks. This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. David in the Psalms models the right attitude towards God that we need to manifest, appealing to him for grace, for his great sin, when Nathan the prophet came to him to confront him with his, because of his sin with Bathsheba. Psalm 51, 1 through 4. And it's interesting, this particular psalm, it's a, it's a prayer, but it's actually drafted up as a song for the choir. He says, be gracious to me, O God, 
according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. He goes on in verses 10 through 13 to write out what he wants in part as the outcome of his confession. Verses 10 through 13 of Psalm 51 Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. And do, not your, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. It's not just about God relenting from destroying David. The desired outcome that David is expressing in his prayer is to be restored in his relationship for, um, to God so that he can be used to teach others about the Lord so that they would be converted over to righteousness from death and destruction. He has a restorative perspective so that he can be a vessel that's used when you sin. Is this what you pray to? Is your desire to be restored so that you can continue to be used by God as your primary focus. I've sinned in the past, believe it or not, <laughs> lots. And my concern is that the enemy is not successful with me to render me ineffective for ministry. I want to be used by him. And that's a huge concern. Look at what's happening across this nation in churches. The enemy is having a heyday. William G. Blakey comments on the unfolding events. From the first, Saul had conducted himself admirably. He had not delayed an hour in taking the proper steps. Though wearied probably with his day's work among the herd, remember, he was walking back with the oxen. He was plowing in the field. He set about the necessary arrangements with the utmost promptitude. It was a serious undertaking. First, to rouse the necessary pitch of people who are more disposed to weep and wring their hands than to keep their heads and devise a way of escape in their hour of danger. Second, to gather a sufficient army to his standard. Third, to march across the Jordan, attack the foe, confident and well-equipped, and deliver a beleaguered city. But dangers and difficulties only roused Saul to higher exertions. And now, when in one short week he has, a, he has completed an enterprise worthy to rank among the highest in the history of the nation, it is no wonder that the satisfaction of the people reaches an enthusiastic climax. What comes next is a true expression of an attitude of gratitude. 1 Samuel eleven fourteen through 15. Then Samuel said to the people, Come, and let us go to Gilgal and renew the kingdom there. So all the people went to Gilgal, and there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. There they also offered sacrifices of peace offerings before the Lord. And there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. Samuel is in lockstep with Saul. He is seizing the moment to accomplish a couple of things. Firstly, he wanted to renew the kingdom. What does this mean, renew the kingdom? Well, uh, well the focus and intent of the renewal was to reaffirm Saul's right to be the king of Israel. Samuel trusted God. He knows that Saul is the anointed king. He knows that the banner of authority has been moved. It's been handed over, and he is no longer in charge. Samuel had no issue with this direction because his trust is in God. He has no ego. Do you struggle with others being in charge over you? MacArthur shares the following thoughts. The process 
of entering the kingship was the same for both Saul and David. And we'll learn more about that. Number one, he was commissioned by the Lord. Number two, he was confirmed by military victory. And number three, he was crowned then as king. Secondly, he wanted to recognize what God had done for them that day and in such short order. By the time the sun is hot, they came into the camp early. The people were not awake, the Ammonites. They were not prepared. No scouts out to yell, hey, the enemy's coming. It happened quickly. But he wanted to recognize what God had done for them. And they offered peace offerings to bless the Lord. Victory was swift and sure. Leviticus 7.13 talks about peace offerings. With the sacrifice of his peace offerings for thanksgiving, he shall present his offering with the cake of unleavened bread. Peace offerings came from a, a heart of gratitude, a heart of thanksgiving. When we give the offering to the Lord through our tithe, do we do it out of necessity or with a true heart of thanksgiving and gratitude for what he has done for us? Stevenson shares Gilgal was located on the western bank of the Jordan River. It was here that Joshua and the Israelites first camped after crossing the Jordan River. They had built a monument here of 12 memorial stones. And it was here that the Israelites had renewed the covenant, circumcising all the men in the camp. This was a place of victory, celebration, memorial, rededication. We're going to learn more about Gilgal in the the continuation of our exploration in 1 Samuel. It was not only a place of victory, celebration, memorial, and rededication, but grief and great sorrow will also be found at Gilgal. Until next Sunday, Lord willing, finally... Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth. You need to know his word, read his word. And having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Amen.